Minneapolis and Anne Arundel County are rich in history, from the oldest working state house in America to the ancient villages at Pig Point. Today, we bring you the story of the county's namesake, Lady Baltimore, Anne Arundel. It is a story of two wealthy and powerful families joining forces to find riches and religious freedom in the New World. They were shrewd politicians and famous warriors, larger-than-life characters who made colonization their life's work. So who is Anne Arundel? She was a wife, a mother, an aristocrat, a benefactor, even an artist. Let's go back 400 years to the time Anne Arundel lived. She was born in 1615 in Wilshire, England. She was married as young as 13 and had as many as nine children, most of whom did not survive. She died in 1649, which is young, even for those days. Historians have precious few artifacts at their disposal to tell the story of Anne Arundel. The three most telling are her portrait, an ancient coin, and her tombstone. The most famous image of Lady Baltimore is this portrait, believed to have been painted by Anthony Van Dyke, the official artist to the king. Anne Arundel comes from the top echelons of society. Many times in the modern era, people like to talk about the 1%. That's not technically true. It's always the 10%. 10% of the people own 90% of the stuff. Anne was in that 10%. She married into a family that had served the king. They traveled in the royal circles until their religion put them somewhat into the shadows. Van Dyck was a premier painter, not only in terms of talent, but in terms of who he served. He was painter to the king. What was happening in the world during Anne's life? The great poet and playwright William Shakespeare died just a year after Anne was born. When she was five years old, the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. Three years later, Shakespeare's tale of shipwreck in the New World, The Tempest, is published. In 1625, Charles I becomes king. Anne married Cecilius Calvert in 1627 at the age of 13, and in 1634, the first settlers arrived in Maryland at St. Mary's. Eight years later, the bloody English Civil War pits parliamentarians against royalists. The year Anne died marked the end of the Civil War and the execution of King Charles by the Roundheads. Anne lived during a tumultuous period for England. Anne was a Catholic, and England was experiencing religious and civil wars throughout her life, while also seeking out colonies across the Atlantic. Catholics were not allowed to vote, hold public office, or serve in the military. They also paid higher taxes. The family was quite prominent as Catholics. They were among the leading families in England at the time, but she was cultivated, she had been educated, and she clearly had much grace and charm, I think. And they're just everything we know, what we do know about her suggests that she was a very elegant woman who had been raised in a household surrounded by art, statuary. Her father had visited Rome, New Europe. She was a very, very uh, well-formed uh, woman. Many of the details of Anne's life are a mystery, but the stories of her famous family shed a lot of light on the kind of person she was. George Calvert was a brilliant politician who rose from nothing to the right-hand man of the king. Thomas Arundel was an amazing warrior and tactician. These two men and their large fortunes were joined when George's son Cecil, or Cecilius, was married to Thomas's daughter, Anne. Thomas Arundel earned his stripes on the battlefield. He spent his life going back and forth from considerable wealth and power to losing everything in a shipwreck and getting thrown in jail for being Catholic. Queen Elizabeth sent him to Europe to help fight the Turks or the Muslims who were trying to take over Europe. And he was apparently a very able soldier. And at the Battle of Gran in Hungary, he ran ahead of the army, according to the accounts, with his broadsword, killed six of the enemy, and from the seventh, grabbed the flag and took it back to their lines. This was only the second Turkish flag uh, 
captured in any of the wars. It was such a big deal that the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire made him a count. And he gave him a seal that still survives in England, a wax seal attached to his official document, making him a count of the Holy Roman Empire. It's a beautiful red wax seal with the dragons and everything around it. And what was interesting, the document that made him a count also applied to his posterity, male and female. So Anne Arundel was a countess of the Holy Roman Empire as well. This was such a big deal that Emperor Rudolph sent Thomas to the Vatican and he presented the flag to the Pope. And it was in the Vatican at least until 1790. <laughs> so he, he has gotten honors, he's given gold, he's given all kinds of stuff. He sails back to England and he's shipwrecked. His horses, his gold, all of that is lost except for the documents he had on him, a letter to the queen, and this formal statement making him a count. So what does Queen Elizabeth do? Does she welcome him and glad that he did such great service? No. no. She throws a tissy fit. She throws him in prison in the Tower of London. Why? Because how dare he accept a title, title from another crown. The Arundels and the Calverts were constantly caught in the middle of religious wars boiling over around them. As Catholics, they were at times courted by kings and queens or punished by those same royals for their religious beliefs. The suspicion of Catholicism and their legal standing did not necessarily bind a king with whom he associated. He could not necessarily hold a Catholic in office, but that did not mean that he could not hold a Catholic close to his heart. And so many Catholics circulated around Charles' court. His wife, Henrietta Maria, is Catholic, very, very French, to the point where in order to make her more acceptable to the English people, Charles has her known locally as Mary instead of Henrietta Maria. And thus the Calverts will disguise the naming of their colony, supposedly for the queen, Mary Land, whereas the Catholics among them thought that it was named after the mother of Jesus. It could conveniently be both with great discretion. So Catholics may be questioned by the nation, they might be limited by law, but the king himself kept company with them. And his wife had a circle of them around her, which constantly infuriated the Puritans. George Calvert, Anne's father-in-law, also faced problems as a Catholic. But much like Thomas Arundel, he was able to thrive despite religious persecution. Calvert was born of modest means with no titles and no land. He rose to become one of the most powerful men in England, joined the Calvert and Arundel families as one, and of course, colonized the state of Maryland. George Calvert's success, despite so many odds, is pretty unique in medieval England. It's unheard of. It just doesn't happen in England. And it's just amazing. That's the only example I know of anywhere where somebody, not only in modest means, but from a very remote primitive part of the country, which it still is, uh, can do that. George was raised as a Catholic until the age of 12, George Calvert, and then he was forcefully taken from his parents, placed with a Protestant tutor, and from the age of 12, he effectively lived as an Anglican, as such. He rose, I mean, a, a kid from a rural setting, a farm, rose incredibly to become next to the king in power in England. I mean, James I appointed him as one of the principal secretaries of state, which is about as high as you could go in English government. In 1624, at the height of his power, he decided to convert or reconvert to the Catholic faith, and that made him unable to be a government official any longer. The king, though, had valued everything he had done for the, the country. 
he still wanted to keep him on as an advisor, which was also quite unusual at the time period. But Calvert said, I, I need to back away from this. He turned his attentions to settlement in America, and the king, out of gratitude, made him a baron, the lord of Baltimore in Ireland. So, despite George Calvert's Catholicism, he was granted the charter to Maryland by the crown. His son Cecil and Cecil's wife Anne would be responsible for making the settlement a reality. At the time, the joke that Anglicans are Catholic without the Pope was fairly well true. But as Henry aged, and more importantly when his son took over, England moved more and more into the ranks of the true Protestant theologies, giving rise to even a Catholic, anti-Catholic branch, the Calvinists, who believed in predestination rather than free will and salvation. Those Puritans became stronger and stronger and more numerous through Europe, and particularly in England. Queen Elizabeth did not approve of them, but she tolerated them. In fact, she said, I do not wish to make windows into men's souls so long as they be good Englishmen. Nationalism above religion. Anne Arundel County is not the only place in Maryland bearing a name associated with the Calverts. Seven other counties and Baltimore City also have ties to the founding family. Calvert, Cecil for Anne's husband, and Charles for Anne's son. Talbot is the married name of Cecil's sister. Frederick is believed to be named after the sixth Lord Baltimore, and Harford after another former governor and Frederick's illegitimate son. I would say one other thing on the naming of the county I think is significant, and that is that the names were usually presented from this side of the Atlantic, but they were almost always chosen from that side. And as you look at a place like Talbot County, we see that Catholic and noble connection. We see Arundel, not the married name, the maiden name. And thus, the local colonists honored not only Charles County, Culvert County, Harford County later in history, these direct references to the proprietary family, Baltimore County, <laughs> and eventually town and city. We also see that there's an awareness of the social and economic circles in which they traveled and recognition here on this side, Worcester, Salisbury, all political, personal, and sometimes economic allies of the Culverts. The Calverts devoted their lives to establishing a settlement in the New World. Their first attempt, Newfoundland, was a failure. In 1621, when Anne was about six years old, settlers under the Calvert arms headed for what they would call Fairyland. These are transatlantic vessels. These are expensive endeavors to publicize and advertise and gather together your settlers, both Catholic and Protestant, required tremendous investment at ridiculous risk. Perhaps you've seen the mock-up of those vessels. I wouldn't want to cross the bay in those, much less the Atlantic. As a result of that, it's a very high-risk element. There are other risks that they had didn't anticipate. The path was not straight across the Atlantic. That would take you months if you ever made it. They did make it, but the settlers quickly learned that they did not like Newfoundland at all. George Calvert was also a beautiful writer, very articulate. I wrote back to King Charles asking him to abandon the colony because it was untenable and uh, he and his family were there for over a winter. And he said, uh, he wrote to the king, he said, the sad face of winter is upon this land from May, from September until May. And I think I may have some foreign service friends who retired and built a house in Newfoundland and I ran into them and she said, well, he should have said September until June. The Calverts would continue their search for a warmer climate and better farmland. And in 1632, the king granted them the charter to Maryland. Anne was a teenager and a few years into her marriage with George's son, Cecil. George had achieved his greatest goal in life. So then, of course, he died a few months before the charter was completed, and that was the 20th of June. We call it Charter Day, 1632. Then it fell to Cecilius to 
make Maryland a reality. He spent everything the family had to get this colony going. I suspect that his father-in-law, even though he was greatly in debt, Sir Thomas uh, or Lord Arundel of Wardour, I think he invested. There's some suggestion Anne herself put some of her personal money into the colony. They, play, they rolled the dice with everything they had, and it succeeded. Cecil sent his brother Leonard to start the new colony and serve as the first governor. Construction of his home in historic St. Mary's began the year Anne Arundel's son Charles was born. Of course, life was no bed of roses for the settlers. Maryland would make the Calverts rich with tobacco yields, but the early years were tough. There's a misnomer throughout America's history that Maryland was a Catholic colony. That is completely an error. Many of the leaders were, but the vast majority of the population from day one were of other faiths. So it was only a minority that was actually Catholic. Uh, and Cecilius Calvert was very careful to try to make sure that people of other faiths had government positions, could serve on the council, had uh, places where they did not feel they were being forced to do something because of Catholics. George Calvert had one more stroke of genius. It was the matter of dividing the land that would become Maryland from Virginia, which is still a source of angst for Virginia. He didn't make the boundary the middle of the Potomac River. He made it the high water line on the south shore so that Maryland owned the entire rivers of the Potomac. So that was a brilliant move, giving Maryland all the water resources that would have been there. How much do we really know about Anne Arundel? We know that her son Charles became the sixth governor in Maryland, the settlement she never had a chance to visit. We know she was born in Wardour Castle, which was attacked and burned by the Roundheads in 1643. We know the dates of her birth and death from her tombstone in St. John's Church in Tisbury, England. But there are several discrepancies in historical records about her age, when she was born, how many children she had, and how she died. We are so attached to the factual data in our modern world that I sometimes think we miss that which may be a little less tangible. What was her role? What was her impact? And it may be hard to discern that because of the lack of papers, because of the lack of commentaries. But once we put her in her context, and once we see that she was esteemed enough for the local government to memorialize her, perhaps, given the dates and the foundation of the county, that her status and her standing was well respected, certainly by the proprietary family, but also the colonists themselves. And perhaps that's more important than how many children did she have? Do we really know what Anne Arundel looked like? We know of at least six images of her. Some hang in the Arundel Center in Annapolis. One in her family home, Hook Manor in England. One in the Benson Hammond House in Linthicum, Maryland one at the County's Historical Society in Glen Burnie. Of course, there was no photography when she was alive, so we see differences in the images of her. Historians differ over which might be accurate, but they agree that the closest would be the Van Dyke painting hanging in her ancestral home and a coin that was minted to honor the marriage of Cecil and Anne. America has a tradition of recalling its past. We don't recall it very accurately very often. We tend to leave out the dark spots and praise the light. And often when we look back in history and we have a celebration, we try very hard to connect and often through imagery. And so at the revolution, there were paintings of revolutionary figures taken from etchings of the 19th century, which may or may not have been taking of portraits from the 18th century. It gets even harder as we go back in time and true portraiture is harder to locate. So we find that there are very few images, including the one of Van Dyck, which has been lost to posterity. What a terrible loss to art, what a terrible loss to Maryland history, which hasn't stopped anyone from the more modern period of trying to render her. Well, we do have a contemporary illustration. It's from a medallion that was struck by the very wealthy family, a coin, a commemorative coin, which we still do in the United States today. And on that is an image of the bride and groom. Since it was commissioned by those, <laughs> 
one would imagine that it was approved by them. Is it precisely accurate? Are the freckles gone? Are the blemishes missing? Well, of course they are. The painters would have done the same thing. But it is the closest that we have, and therefore I believe what should we should look to when we try to get an image of what Anne might have looked like. After that, if there's such thing as poetic license, artists take it much further. In 1643, just six years before Anne Arundel died, there was another epic event that illustrated the problems Catholics had in England, as well as the heroism of the Calverts and the Arundels. The Puritans, also known as the Roundheads, burned her childhood home. In the, the Civil War, which began 1640, early 40s, between Charles I and Parliament, was a devastating thing that destroyed much of England. The Arundels, because they had been supporters of the crown, sided with Charles I. Uh, Anne's brother uh, got a company of cavalry and went and fought for the king. He was unfortunately wounded in battle and killed. The same time he was lying wounded and dying, the family home of Wardour Castle was put under siege by the parliamentary forces. And this is another one of those stories that is amazing. His wife, Blanche, Lady Blanche Arundel, was asked by the troops that were surrounding the castle to surrender. surrender. And she said, no, no, I have been ordered by my husband to maintain and hold this castle and I shall obey his order. Well, what was interesting is she had her daughter-in-law, her step, her grandchildren, some servants and 25 men. The army against them was 1,300 troops with cannon. They laid siege and began shelling Wardour Castle for seven days. And they kept shooting. The men killed 60 of the enemy from firing at them. At the end, they said they were so tired that they weren't sure that the men would put the ball in first or the powder in first into their muskets because they were exhausted from seven days of minimal sleep, minimal food. So the women servants started loading the rifles for them so they could shoot. Uh, just an incredible thing. And then the troops put a mine under gunpowder under a tunnel under the wall and threatened to blow it up. Now this would have destroyed the castle. They were also out of food. They hadn't been prepared for siege. So Lady Blanche asked for terms. And at least she said, well, we're gonna let the women go, but all the men are gonna be executed. She says, no way, I'm not gonna do this. So she holds out. Finally, they agree, okay, everybody will be given quarter. The women will be able to take all their possessions with them, along with six servants and an inventory will be held, made of the entire estate and copies given to both the victorious troops and the Arundels, and it will be respected and maintained. The only one of those provisions after the surrender they honored was the first one. They didn't kill anybody. They looted the building. They forced Lady Blanche and her family with only the clothes on their backs to leave, be taken prisoners, 100,000 pounds sterling of damage was done to Wardour Castle. Extraordinary. But it was still a castle, so the Parliament took it over. Her son, Henry Arundel, brought troops back and laid siege to his own home. They maintained that siege for almost a year. Finally, they used the same tactic of putting gunpowder and threatening to blow it up. But by accident, it exploded. They destroyed the building and it could never again be a place that people could live. Today, Wardour Castle still stands as a ruin. It is an amazing site in a beautiful landscape and it is testimony to the violence of the English Civil War and the Arundel role in that awful conflict. If we were to step inside of Wardour Castle in Anne Arundel's time, the wealth and power of her family would be obvious. We are again talking about that 10% where the Calvert household had dozens of direct employees simply to maintain the household. 
where two or three people might assist you in getting dressed. And if you've seen the Jacobian dresses that women wore, then you'll get an idea of why it might take two or three just to get you into that tapestry of itself, that showpiece of a gown with all of its different pieces and parts that one woman could not possibly get herself into. We know from a 1605 account, an inventory, of the extraordinary quality of that castle. There was tapestries showing the siege of Troy or stories from the Iliad and the Odyssey. There was statues of popes and ancient figures like Aristotle. There was paintings of all varieties there. Elegant glassware, just amazing. One of the largest collections, and this is 1605, the, probably, the, except for the royal collection, the largest collection of extraordinarily rare Chinese porcelain in all of Britain. Just amazing things. So she was in this environment that was uh, truly extraordinary. It's like living in a museum in some respects. It was so rich with art and, and ancient things and arms that her father had captured from the Turks, for example. An ostrich egg in one of the rooms was on display. Such a rare thing. There is so much more to learn about Anne Arundel. Dr. Henry Miller of Historic St. Mary's City has made an exciting discovery of a game board he is confident was drawn and painted by Anne herself. It was in the family library at Wardour Castle, which has never been analyzed from the perspective of learning about Anne and Cecil. It shows beasts and dragons and people killing dragons. It shows the family motto, Wardour Castle mentions that. Decorations, it must have, she must have been influenced by medieval bestiaries that were in the family library because I've shown it to scholars at uh, Folger Shakespeare Library, the British Museum. They've all said, oh, that's got to be cut out of a medieval manuscript, but it's not. It's been painted on the parchment. And this shows artistic quality. It is a beautiful object that I hope we can do a major publication about it because it's never been seen before. She died in, in Winchester uh, City July of 1649. Her body was transported to the Wardour area to the village of Tisbury where the family had been buried in Tisbury Church, St. John's Church, for over a century and a half. And her husband, Cecilius, wrote a tombstone uh, statement for her and had it designed. It has an image on it that combines the Calvert family uh, symbol along with the sparrows of the Arundel family. And I think what he wrote is really beautiful because it's the best thing we have expressing how Cecilius Calvert viewed his wife. And I'd like to read a translation, it's in Latin. But what it says is, here lies Anne Arundel, Lady Baltimore, epitome of all the qualities of the phoenix that there are in flowers, and buds, and graces, those being as great as there are in heaven. Farewell. No other woman's love in the world was to be so requited. She left this world on July 23rd in the 1649th year, from the childhood of God in the 34th year of her age. This memorial was set up by her husband for his love's sake. What better tribute to Anne Arundel than to name this beautiful county after her? It is the crown of the Chesapeake and the capital of Maryland, the land of pleasant living, it is the place where religious freedom was born and the grand experiment of democracy would start to take shape. Surely, Anne Arundel would be very pleased. You can find out more about Anne Arundel, the Calvert family, and the establishment of Maryland on our YouTube page.